In the previous video, we discussed the first diagnostic test for BPPV, and that was the Dix Hall Pike maneuver. We're going to switch gears in this video and talk about the second diagnostic test, which is the horizontal roll maneuver. So let's suppose that you have your patient who you suspect has BPPV based on subjective reports of dizziness, and they indicate that the room is spinning with a visual change. So we mentioned that the first test you would do would be the Dix Hall Pike maneuver. In order for the Dix Hall Pike maneuver to be positive, you have to get reproduction of vertical nystagmus. And that vertical nystagmus can either be downbeating, implicating the anterior canal, or it can be upbeating, implicating the posterior canal. So what happens if you perform the Dix Hall Pike maneuver and you don't get vertical nystagmus? Then it is not a positive test, it is a negative test. A negative Dix Hall Pike maneuver is normally associated with one of two results, either the reproduction of horizontal nystagmus or no nystagmus at all with the maneuver. Now, the horizontal nystagmus is a lot less common, and it could theoretically indicate an issue with the horizontal canal, but more often than not, if you get this with a Dix Hall Pike maneuver, it actually indicates more of a central issue like multiple sclerosis or something like that. More commonly, though, if the Dix Hall Pike maneuver is negative, it's just going to reproduce no nystagmus at all. But either way, to rule out BPPV, you need to perform the second diagnostic maneuver, which is the horizontal roll maneuver. Now, the interpretation of the results for the horizontal roll maneuver is very different than it is for the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, and we'll be covering this interpretation in a few minutes. But for now, let's begin by talking about how you actually do this maneuver. So to perform the horizontal roll test or maneuver, the initial patient position is going to be in supine, as you see right here, with the patient's neck flexed to about 30 degrees, so 30 degrees of cervical flexion. You can certainly rest their head on a pillow, but in the end, you're still going to have to hold their head with your hands, so I just prefer to not use a pillow and support their head with my hands, as you see right here. So right here, I have the patient's head supported, her neck is flexed to about 30 degrees, and I'm going to rotate her head in one direction, we'll start with the right, about 90 degrees, while I maintain that 30 degrees of cervical flexion. So it should look like this. And you're going to observe the eyes for nystagmus. Now, if you've got recording goggles on the patient, all the better. You can just watch the computer screen. If you don't have recording goggles, then you're going to have to look directly into the patient's eyes. So, of course, they're going to have to have their eyes open and preferably fixed on some object uh, in front of them. So that way their eyes aren't moving around and you can accurately observe for nystagmus. Now, in terms of the nystagmus, remember that nystagmus can have a latency anywhere between about 2 and 10 seconds, although it's normally on the shorter end, usually down about 2 to 5 seconds. So, no matter what, you need to observe the patient's eyes for at least 30 seconds to ensure that if there is going to be nystagmus, that you catch it. However, we would never expect a latency of 30 seconds, so if it doesn't appear in 30 seconds, you can conclude that that test is negative. Now, if you do catch nystagmus, you need to be sure to record the time from its onset to the time that it fatigues or stops. And that time is going to become very important later on when we're differentiating whether or not we have a horizontal canalothiasis or a cupulolithiasis, and that also dictates the treatment. So you need to record that time. What I just showed you was a horizontal roll maneuver assessing the right horizontal canal. However, I also need to assess the left horizontal canal. So from this position, I'm going to bring her back to neutral rotation with 30 degrees of cervical flexion, and from here I'm going to wait for all symptoms to go away. That includes nystagmus, that includes subjective reports of dizziness, nausea, etc. Now I'm going to assess the left horizontal canal doing the exact same thing except rotation in the opposite direction. So maintaining that 30 degrees of cervical flexion and getting close to 90 degrees of rotation to the left. Again, I'm going to watch for nystagmus and record its time if present. Another very important thing you need to monitor with the horizontal roll maneuver is which direction of rotation of the head produced worse symptoms from the patient's perspective. They may report that rotating the head right, like you see here, was worse or rotating the head left was worse. And knowing which side was worse from the patient's perspective is going to help you figure out what's the affected side. Is it the left canal or is it the right? So let's get into the results interpretation, make some sense of this. 
So what constitutes a positive horizontal roll maneuver? That would be the reproduction of horizontal nystagmus, which can be classified as either geotropic or ageotropic. We're going to look at geotropic nystagmus first. So what does geo mean? Geo means earth. So geotropic nystagmus is nystagmus that beats toward the ground, toward the earth. In other words, the fast beat is towards the ground. So if we use this test position right here and we observe nystagmus, geotropic nystagmus would have each eye with the fast beat toward the ground. So it would look like this. So fast toward the ground, slow back up. Fast towards the ground, slow back up. Fast towards the ground, slow back up. And both eyes should do the same thing. So the left eye would also do the same thing. Fast towards the ground, slow back up. Fast towards the ground, slow back up. That means you have geotropic horizontal nystagmus. And both eyes are going to do the exact same thing. Also associated with geotropic nystagmus is that the nystagmus should last less than 60 seconds. In general, if you have geotropic nystagmus, it will not last longer than a minute. It's going to last less than a minute. And when you have nystagmus lasting less than a minute, that is a canalithiasis. Recall that's where the autoliths are not adhered to the cupula. Okay? They're free-floating within the canal. The other important thing about geotropic nystagmus is that the affected side is always the side with worse symptoms. If you see that geotropic nystagmus, and she reports that the left side, so left rotation, had worse symptoms, then the left side is the affected side. So the affected side is always the side with worse symptoms. That's true of geotropic nystagmus. Let's now look at ageotropic nystagmus. So if geo is toward the ground, you can imagine ageotropic, A is opposite, means toward the ceiling. So the fast beat is away from the ground or toward the ceiling, however you want to look at it. So that would look like this. So here's her left eye, fast beat up, slow back. Fast beat up, slow back. Same thing in the right eye. Fast beat up, slow back. Fast beat up, slow back. That would be ageotropic nystagmus. And everything's the opposite here. If you have ageotropic nystagmus, you would expect that the nystagmus would last longer than a minute. And if it lasts longer than a minute, that is a cupulolithiasis, where the autoliths are adhered to the cupula. And in this case, the affected side is the side with less severe symptoms. So if you see this ageotropic nystagmus, and she reports that rotation of her head to the right was worse, that actually means the left side is the affected side, because the affected side is the side with less severe symptoms. So here's a test style question to help you better understand this interpretation. So suppose a horizontal roll test, or maneuver, with the head rotated 90 degrees to the right, produced nystagmus with a fast beat toward the floor, which fatigued 45 seconds after its initial onset. So we know several things from this one sentence. First of all, we have nystagmus that have fast beat toward the floor. That would be geotropic nystagmus, because toward the floor is toward the earth, geo, geotropic nystagmus. Based on that, we should expect that the nystagmus should last less than a minute, because those two go together. And sure enough, the nystagmus fatigued after 45 seconds, so its duration was 45 seconds. That's consistent with geotropic nystagmus. More information. There was a similar result with the left side, so rotation left, except the symptoms were worse. Okay? And that's symptoms reported by the patient. So they thought rotation of their head to the left was worse than rotation to the right. Well, what do we know about geotropic nystagmus? The affected side is the side with worse symptoms. So therefore, if they thought left rotation was worse, then the left side is affected. So if we're diagnosing this specific BPPV, we know it's left-sided, we know it's horizontal canal or lateral canal, and it's a canalothiasis because, again, Geotropic nystagmus correlates with a canalothiasis, also confirmed by the fact that the nystagmus lasted less than a minute. So lateral, horizontal canal, canalothiasis. Hopefully that makes sense. Now in the end, if you go through the Dix Hall Pike maneuver and it's negative, and you go through the horizontal roll maneuver and it's also negative, you can pretty strongly rule down BPPV as the cause of the patient's dizziness. 
In some very rare cases, you might have a situation where the patient actually does have BPPV, but these two tests just happen to be negative for whatever reason. So you would, of course, go with some other different treatment plan. If that's not working at a later time, you might come back and reassess BPPV by doing these two diagnostic tests. But in general, if you have BPPV, one of these two tests is going to be positive. Dick's hole pike maneuver for posterior and anterior canals, and horizontal roll maneuver for the horizontal, aka lateral, canals. Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding about the horizontal roll maneuver and its interpretation. In the next few videos, we're going to start discussing the various treatment techniques that you would use for canal lithiases and cupular lithiases of the given canals. Join us then. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.